Welcome you on this beautiful Palm Sunday to Community Life Church. My name is Scott Marino, and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and it is an honor to have you here with us or have you joining us online. Um, We've got great services planned for you today, and we're just looking forward to seeing what what God is going to do. So a couple quick announcements before we jump into the service today. So next week is Easter, and uh, on that weekend we have four services, and so Saturday night at 6 o'clock, and Sunday morning at 7.30, those two services, they have child care from babies to uh, kindergarten, five years of age. And then um, at the 9 and 10.45 services, um, we have full child care, but it's going to be absolutely amazing. So show up, pick one of those. If you're worried about the crowds, make sure you come to either Saturday night or early on Sunday morning. It's going to be awesome. And then also we have Holy Week services this week. So on Thursday and Friday, we have our Monday Thursday service. Um, that's going to be at 6 o'clock, and our Good Friday service is at 6 o'clock. And I encourage you to come. Uh, Thursday night, we're going to take communion. We actually have a bunch of people that are going to dress up like disciples, and we're going to set a big table here in the middle of the room to look like a triclinium, and I'll take you through some of the story as we read John chapter 13. So it should be a, a wonderful night, and uh, just looking forward to kind of making our way through this week and trying to experience everything that God has for us. Amen? Amen. All right, I invite you if you want to stand. And let's start this morning off by by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just so love you, God, and we're so appreciative of of opportunities to really just silence our heart and prepare for what we know you're going to do today. And God, I know that, that each and every person that's here and those that are logging in online, God, that we all have things that we're thinking about and praying about and, and maybe carrying today. And I just pray that throughout the course of the day that you give us the ability to, to, to just offload some of those things and to entrust the God of creation, the great physician. Uh, the one who offers us hope and gives us peace, Lord, that, that maybe today we would just entrust those things to you and know that you have something to say about each and every one of them. And God, as we think about today being that, that Sunday morning where we celebrate the triumphal entry, when Jesus enters into Jerusalem and, and maybe for that last moment in his life, he was recognized as being something more than, than just what we probably saw on the surface. God, we pray that those shouts of acclamation God, would only continue to grow inside of our hearts despite what we're going to experience over this this next week as we go through Holy Week, that God will understand the true reason why you sent your son. Lord, it was to be the savior of this world. And so we just offer you today our lives, our, our hearts, and just pray that you would awaken something new inside of us today. We love you. We trust you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, we just, let's prepare our hearts this morning as we sing for the message and just to get ourselves in the place. We know that God's got something for us today, so let's just worship this and sing this together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest with a I fall apart You're the one And guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every hour Oh God, how I need you Oh sin moves deep Your grace is more Where grace is found That's where you are Christ 
rest in your presence this morning. We do need you. And we thank you so much just for being here in this place. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here to do in us and work through us in whatever way that you need to today. But we recognize on Palm Sunday, Lord, we shout your praise today. We sing Hosanna. We know that you are the Savior of the world, but you're also the Savior of our souls today. And so we just thank you for being here. Come and do your work in our heart as Jim Bell um, comes to deliver the message today. God, we pray that you would use this to draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for singing and worshiping with us. You can be seated. Good morning. When Scott was leaving, he says, I forgot to tell them there's communion today. I think you noticed that. It'll be okay, Scott. Well, we are nearing the close of our study of our, our buddy Abraham. And here we're going to look today, in, in the, we're going to be in the 24th chapter of Genesis, and in that 24th chapter of Genesis, we come to this very entertaining, and it's a really a delightful story of Abraham sending his servant out to find a wife for his son Isaac. And this love story that we see here between Isaac and Rebekah is, is really one of the tenderest and sweetest uh, Old Testament messages and stories that we could even possibly find. It's, and it's a lot of more than just the boy meets girl type of a story. It's a story that, that has meaning for us so many years later. And although it's pretty evident toward the end of the life of Abraham that these incidents we find here really, yeah, that happened there, but there's such a lesson for us living 4,000 years afterwards that we can learn so much about ourselves, and, and in fact, we are part of this story as well. For example, in the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, we place ourselves right there. There is a message for us uh, that is as, as open and as, as plain as what we read in, in, in the Scriptures. And so it's easy to see how this was designed by the Spirit of God 2,000 years before our Lord was born, it, it illustrates something to us. It illustrates the heart of the Father that, it, that becomes so involved in the cross at Calvary. 
you know, as you read about and you can actually just see in your mind's eye Abraham and Isaac trudging up this mountain together that you can sense the anguish in this man's heart that he's going to have to perhaps sacrifice the promised son. We see that again. Cross of Calvary. The father's heart is moved because he's going to give up his one and only son. So these stories that we read about in the Old Testament, they're just not Old Testament stories. They are Old Testament stories with a meaning and a purpose for us today. And this is especially true in this story that we're going to look at today of Rebecca and Isaac. Because it's really a, it's really a picture of Pentecost, this whole episode we're going to see today. You know, here is Abraham sort of standing or being a mirror of God the Father, and he sends this unnamed servant. We don't even know who this guy is. He doesn't have a name. And he sends him into a far country to take a bride or choose a bride for his son Isaac. And he wants to invite her to come back to the house where the son is waiting, and he's going to claim her as his bride. Now, how beautifully that portrays how God, on that same day of Pentecost, sent his spirit into the world. You know, it's the spirit's job to call out a people for God's name. It's the job of the spirit to win a bride for Christ. And God has been at this chore, if you will, work, if you will, for some 2,000 years now. And the son is waiting to receive the bride. You know, we read in the book of Revelation of the wedding supper of the Lamb and of the Lord that is coming to claim what is his, the bride of Christ. So it's important for us to not lose the individual application of these truths that we look at as, oh, just an old, it's just an old tale. The Apostle Paul, in referencing these Old Testament stories, he says this, he says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings to us on, the, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. In other words, these places, he says, these are part of our stories. These are part of the way we are to live our lives. They're just not written for historical facts or historical references. They're written to, above all anything else, they're, they're written to teach us something, actively teach us something today. And therefore, we don't want to read over these things. We want to read into these things. We want to see exactly what's there that is meant for us. So we need to keep this in mind when you open that book and, you see, and you're looking for anywhere from Genesis to Malachi in that Old Testament. A lot of people don't like to read there. We need to go into that section of the Scriptures and say, what is God trying to teach me? How is he relating this story to the story of Christ to my story? You know, as Christians, we say that our role in this story is that of the bride. That's our role. You know, we're the ones called by the Spirit of God. And we remember how we were wooed, how we were won by the loveliness and the beauty of who Jesus Christ is. And we had this conscientiousness. We had this thing in, inside of our, our, our hearts that said something. We, we need him. There's something missing in us. And we need to have him there. So we were called to love. We were really called to love someone we had never seen. We've never seen him. And we felt an answering response in our hearts as Christ was really painted in very vivid colors for us by the Spirit who was indwelling us. You know, we felt our affections for this world and the affections of this world sort of shifting and sort of changing. And he became really the central or the focal point 
of our entire experience. So if you read this chapter 24 all through, and we're going to read most of this chapter 24 today, you're going to find that the central character of chapter 24 is not Rebecca. It's not the bride. You know, little of her reaction is recorded in this 24th chapter. The spotlight of this story really follows the unnamed servant that Abraham is sending out. He is the focal point. He's the central character, which is also a picture, if you will think about it, it's also a picture of the Holy Spirit's work. But we need to remember that the Spirit of God chooses something. He chooses to do His work largely through you and me, through normal people, men and women who are living their lives today. That's how he chooses oftentimes to get things done. This is especially true in the work of calling out people for God's name, to bring them into the body. Now, the process of bringing others to Christ begins with the command of God the Father. So if you've got your Bibles, like I can say, we're going to read a lot of Genesis chapter 4. We're going to start with uh, verses 1 through 9. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me on earth, saying, to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angels before you so that you can get a wife for me. You can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. So here we see that the initiative starts with who? Starts with, with, the, with Abraham. He sends his servant to do this work. And he binds him to do this work by asking for an oath to be taken. Now, we just read. Now, putting the hand under someone else's thigh will get you arrested today. Let's just be, let's be clear about that. We're, we're living in a different culture right now. But this act that we read about here was simply an Eastern custom recognizing that the loins were where life really begins. It was the source of life. For the servant, it was a representation, if you will, of being bound in the very deepest part of Abraham's life. So this is a very, very important thing. It's a very, very solemn oath that he's taking. Now, as we apply this to our own situation, and we see God the Father standing in the place of Abraham, if you just take it to that level, he is asking every servant to give himself to this very same task. Now, we don't, like I said, we don't know the name of the servant here. And maybe that's on purpose. Maybe it's, maybe it's an intentional way so that we can now insert your name and my name into this story. So that we, in effect, can be the unnamed servant. Because this is not an option. We know, but we know this. This is not an option for people who are in Christ. 
God has said over and over again and again that the obligation rests upon a believer to give him or her to the task of reaching others for Jesus Christ. We know that. We call that the Great Commission. So God has said, take a wife for my son. That's what he wants. And to this end, the Holy Spirit now comes into our hearts to dwell. The purpose of the Holy Spirit, of coming into our lives, is that we might be what he is. And we might do what he came to do. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So if this is what he came to do, we're going to find him doing it in our lives if we give him the opportunity and we yield ourselves to him. Now, notice the restriction here. <laughs> Abraham gives some restrictions here to the servant. He says to him, you must not take my son back there. That's not going, that's not going to be happening. Now, obviously, when you think about it, it would be so much easier if he was able to do that, if, he, if the servant could just take this handsome young man and, and, and take him back to this place with him. You know, he's sort of cutting out the middleman here. Look at right to the, the, the bones of this thing. Much more convenient to convince this girl, who he doesn't know who's going to be at this time, much easier to convince her that she ought to come back and live with this guy if she could put eyeballs on him. She could actually see him. That's not permitted. Can't do that. So we have to question, why was this odd restriction placed upon him? And really, I think the answer here is that it was not just an ordinary incident. This was not just something ordinary in the life of these people. This is divinely planned. It's intended to exemplify and exemplify a truth. It illustrates the fact that God's Son is now in His glory and the work of finding brides, of finding people, of believers, falls on us. God does not send Jesus visibly back to earth in order to win people to himself. He's not here. He has ascended. He has risen. He's in heaven. So he, didn't see, he doesn't send him here. When you think about it, how much easier would it seem to, pers- seem to be to, in order to persuade people and men and women to believe in him if we could just say this to them? Well, here's what's happening. Right now, Jesus is in Atlanta. He's in Atlanta, and we'd love to take you up there right now. In fact, we can, we can get some buses. We can head up there so that you, with your own eyes, can see With your own ears, you could hear him speak. You can take a look and see the nail marks on his wrists and his hands. You could see the wound in his side. Then you can believe. And he's just up up the road here, five and a half hours away. Now, there's a tendency in our hearts to think that that would go pretty good. That that would be better that way. And the Lord says, oh, no. No, 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 no. That's not going to work. That's not, that's not going to be better that way. He sent the Son of God to do the work. And in some remarkable way that we will never fully understand, the Holy Spirit can make Jesus more real to a human being and a human heart than if he stood behind, beside him in human form and flesh. If you don't believe that, Read the Gospels. Do you think the apostles had a rough time with this? And they saw him every day. They listened to him every day. They saw him heal every day. And they're still not sure. So you see the the truth in all this when you consider them, the apostles. Because over three years, they accompanied Jesus. They were constantly in a state of confusion. They were in bewilderment. They were in frustration. They could not understand what he said. How many times did they look clueless when he, when he told them a parable? They were troubled, disturbed, time after time after time. 
However, when the day of Pentecost came and the Spirit of God flooded their hearts, a light bulb came on, if you will. It came on, and they had never seen it there before. And the Scriptures, now for the first time, basically, were opened up to them. It was one of those aha moments, if you will. They became conscious of the reality of who Jesus was, of what he was all about, experienced the joy within themselves that they had never possessed this joy before. They were frustrated before, bewildered. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to make Christ real to human hearts. And that's why God has laid upon every one of us who are all believers, who were indwelt by that same Holy Spirit, the wonderful work of winning brides for Christ. This is our responsibility, and it's the command of the Father's heart. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. You know, so many men and women have heard the command of God, and you've heard it yourself, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. And, and people have heard that over and over. They've recognized this as a command. They know it's a command, but then they go out living their life and acting out as though it all depends upon them. They've got to make the last shot. They've got to carry the ball. They've got to make sure it all happens. In their own mind, they're saying to themselves, it's all up to me. There's a failure to recognize that not only has God commanded us to do this, but he has also provided something. He's provided this Holy Spirit by which to do it. And this is what we see in the steps that, that follow in this story in, in Genesis chapter 4. There are stages that are pictured here in what happens when you and I go out to reach someone, anyone, for Christ. So let's get back to Genesis chapter 4 or 24, and let's start in verse 10, and we're going to go through 14. And he says this, Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Naharaham and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening the time the women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your son Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Okay, now here is a man who is expecting something. He's expecting things to happen. He's expecting God to work. He's looking around for it. So here's the confirmation. There's a truth that is critical for us to grab, that there's an invisible partner at work here because God has not sent him out alone. Now, he doesn't see it, but there's someone there with him. There's a divine call here. And God is at work to move and to shape and to develop the lives and hearts of everyone. And really what we're asked here to do is just recognize that you're not in this yourself. You're not in it by yourself. So this first stage we see here what we're just, it's sort of an expecting stage. Something's going to happen. I'm not sure what it's going to be, but I'm sitting here at this well, and let's just see how this plays out. So that's the first stage. The second stage is confirmation. We're going to go back to verse, uh, chapter 24. We're going to go through verse, starting verse 15, we're going to go through verse 21. Before he had finished praying, before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, 
son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels, too, until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all the camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. So here now is the confirmation. As he watched her, he knew that she was the one because she did exactly what he had asked the Lord as a sign that she should do immediately. This was the hardworking young teenager. That's all she was. She watered the camels. And when you consider (laughs) that one camel, one camel can drink 21 gallons of water, Uh, This is a very busy young lady. You know, we need to be careful, however, about asking for signs. This servant asked for a sign. We need to be careful about doing that in every situation. Because I'll tell you what, what we will do sometimes, truth be told, we sometimes will invent signs. You know, well, as well, if I see this, like, if if the next coin I pick up is on heads, then this is going to happen. But the next is a tails, that means I do something else. You know, we need to keep our spiritual antenna up at all times and not rely on something like that. Because you never know. You will never know if the person on the next seat on the airplane or the next person that you run into at Walmart or Lowe's standing in line is the one that God has placed in your path for you to have a conversation with. You, You just don't know that. Now, of course, if you're managing a herd of camels... You might want to see if someone is also willing to provide them some water. And that's what the servant did. Because if God can arrange an encounter like that, he can do it in any which way he chooses. And we just have to be cognizant and aware of this is the way God reaches people. It's through you. It's through me. And it's through the common everyday circumstances of life. And I'll tell you, going to a a well and drawing water is as ordinary as it comes in first century Palestine. So we have expectation, then we have confirmation, then we go to preparation. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 4, and starting in verse 22 through 27. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. Then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for your father's house for us, in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milcah bore to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder as well as room for you to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshiped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. Abraham's servant knows now that this is the right girl. He's got the right, he's got the right young lady. He has the signs confirmed. Now, oftentimes when you and I, when we are presented with an opportunity to witness or declare the gospel to someone who, someone who God has placed in our path, all too often this is where we open up the scriptures to Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, And we begin to talk to this person about what sinners they are and how all the sinners have fallen short of the glory of God. And sometimes that's exactly where we start. 
And we tell them about how God detests sin, and that's really who we are. That's, that's really our identification since the fall of man. That's not the pattern we see here in this story in Genesis. Here the servant wisely arranges for a private conversation. And he bathes this whole matter again in prayer, in thanksgiving. And he awaits for a suitable time to talk. He doesn't start beating people over the head with their sinful condition. And I'll tell you, way too many people have a starting point in doing that when they talk to people. There's nothing more unattractive of Christianity is to have something like that thrown at you. Now, the fourth step we have here is really the presentation itself. We're going to jump over to verse 34, and we're going to start in verse 34 and go through 53. So we've got a ways to go here. And the servant says, so he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has given, he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, men servants and maid servants and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. My master made me swear an oath and said, you must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live. But go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. Then I asked my master, what if the woman will not come back with me? He replied, the Lord, before whom I, before whom I have walked, will send his angel with you and make your journey a success so that you can get a wife for my son from my own clan and from my family's father's family. Then you will go to my clan. You will be released from my oath even if they refuse to give her to you, and you will be released from my oath. When I came to the spring today, I said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant success to the journey on which I have come. See, I am standing beside the spring. If a maiden comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little from your jar, and if she says to me, drink, and I'll draw water for your camels too, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water, and I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll water your camels too. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to him. Then I put the ring in her nose and the bracelets on her arms, and I bowed down and worshiped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had sent me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, so that I may know, I may know which way to turn. Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go. Let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. Now, the servant leaves nothing out. He's given a complete report here. He's candid. He's forthright. And he doesn't take, worry about how long it's going to take. I want to know, you, want you to know exactly where this whole thing stands. So he begins to talk about the riches of Abraham because it's the inheritance that, that the son is going to, to, uh, to have. He recounts how God led him along the way. It ends by presenting to her the gifts. And with that, he's giving her a sample of the riches that he was offering her. Now, this is a great picture, if you will, of how we should talk to those who are interested on whom and whom the Lord is seeking to reach 
And you do it by focusing everything on Jesus Christ. Our job, our job as believers is not to change people's habits. It's not to change their habits or their attitudes. That isn't our concern. Because I'll tell you, way too many people, and I think some people who are actually professing belief in Christ, too many people think that Christianity is doing something first. It's not doing something first. The doing comes second. What comes first is being something different. Paul calls it being a new creation in Jesus Christ. So our job is not to change people's habits. Our job is to win them over to Christ. Our job is to not make them members of the church's membership roles. That's not your job. The servant did not go into the far country and try to start a Fans for Isaac fan club. That's not what he was doing. His job was to win her heart. Win the heart of Rebecca. Bring her out of the far country to the sun. That's your job. That's my job. Nothing more and nothing less. There's a fifth and final stage, and it's the actual invitation. And we start in chapter 54, and we go through 58. Then he and the men who were with him, ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, send me on my way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, let the girl remain with us 10 days or so, then you may go. But he said to them, do not detain me. Now that the Lord has granted success to my journey, send me on my way so that I may go to my master. Then they said, let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they called Rebekah and asked her, will you go with with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent their master, Rebekah, on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. That is the invitation. This is the altar call, if you please. No questions. This is not an easy choice that Rebecca is being asked to make. When you think about it, it's revolutionary, it's disturbing, it's unsettling. All her life, she has lived in this protected household. She's been protected, she has been secure, she has been cared for, she has been guarded, she's been doted upon. And now, In the space of one short conversation, she is now asked to go with a man she had just met in order to meet another man that is a complete stranger who is going to be her husband. Yet there is something about this conversation that takes place that has won over her heart, and she is ready to go. She's ready to go. And we need to recognize something here. We need to recognize that the invitation we give to men and women that we come in contact with to become Christians, to become believers, to become the adopted sons and daughters of Christ, it's not an easy choice for them. You know, this is really a revolutionary thing we're asking them to do. Finally, in the last scene, we see the communion with the son, Isaac. The work of the Trinity is really evident throughout this story, if you look at it from a higher helicopter. It begins with the command of the Father. It proceeds with the cooperation of the Spirit. And it ends with the marriage and the commitment and the communion with the Son. So the final scene concludes with heart, in effect, meeting heart starting in verse 62 and ending in 67. Now Isaac had come from Beer Laha Roi, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. 
She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The last words of the servant are here. When Rebekah sees Isaac out in the field walking toward him, we see him saying, her saying the same, who is that man? I don't know who that is. And his servant's last words are, he is my master. This is the place to which you and I are to bring men and women so that we can point and say, he is my master. We don't say it by saying all the sinners are going to fall short of the glory of God. We are talking about the vision of who Jesus Christ is. He's my master. The time comes when we deal with people, when we talk to them, when we, when we must turn them to look at the one who is winning their hearts. You're talking, but something else is going on in their hearts that you have nothing to do with. And somewhere the Holy Spirit is telling these people, there he is. There he is. It's the master that you're seeking. It's the master that wants you to find him. So right now, deal with him now. Just talk with him. Be with him. Allow him to speak to you. I'm backing away. The servant has brought, he's been the matchmaker. He's brought the two of these people, young people together. Can you see his reaction? Can you just imagine what his reaction is right now? He had to have the biggest smile on his face. He must look like an idiot. He was just grinning from ear to ear and couldn't get the smile wiped off his face because of what he had done and what part he had played in this event. The joy that must have just been overflowing in his heart at the fulfillment of his mission to bring a bride to his master, a bride to Isaac. How much must this be our experience when you can look back and say, I was a matchmaker. And the way I did it was not to talk about myself and it wasn't to, to, to belittle someone else. And it wasn't to tell them that they weren't worthy of it. I did it because the Holy Spirit opened a heart that I could speak into. My being in Christ allows a venue that they can be in Christ and not worry about the doing until later. You know, the gospel is a very simple, very simple concept. We like to make it so difficult. Don't put on yourself more responsibility than what God wants to give you. You make the introduction. The Holy Spirit will confirm the deal. Would you bow your, bow your heads with me, please? Lord, we thank you for this wonderful story, a very detailed story of the unknown servant and of Isaac and of Rebecca. Lord, as we read this story, we read so much into it that, that it just didn't apply to what was going on 4,000 years ago. It applies to us today as, as, the, as the mirror of, of the bride and the groom and the matchmaker and, and bringing two together to become one. It's in our lives today. So Lord, allow us to learn from this message that it's not, we don't go into this thing alone. We go into it with the power and the glory and the promise of God himself. So Lord, allow this message to resonate in our hearts and allow it to be a, a focal point of all that we say and do when we are called and commanded to increase the realm, to bring people to Christ. That's your holy commission to us. That's what we plan to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. It's first Sunday of the month. It also happens to be Palm Sunday. It's a day in which we are preparing our hearts for this next seven days where we're going to be talking about today the triumphant entry of Jesus into the holy city of Jerusalem and, and how that changed so quickly day after day after day until we came to Friday and we came to his death and crucifixion. And in that week, the Passover meal was celebrated. And in that week, it was changed forever. And it's an indication of what is available to us today because the work has been done. And Jesus is now saying, when you take that meal, it is my body, it is my blood. And as often as you eat of it and drink of it, you do so in remembrance of me. We're here to connect ourselves, to remember the great sacrifice that took place that allows me, allows you, allows all of us who are in Christ 